Hello, Lizzie here. It is now 36 weeks into my pregnancy. And as you can see, belly's getting bigger. I'm feeling really good. And today I wanted to check in and do a little video to share about what I'm focusing on this week, what I am working on when it comes to birth and postpartum prep. And what you'll notice from the six different things that I have been doing this week is that almost all of them are in postpartum preparation and a little bit for birth. And I'll explain why in a little bit. But uh, just to get started, so this week's marks the official kind of nine month period. Um, the pregnancy is 40 weeks long. So at 36 weeks, I'm totally in the home stretch, the kind of completion part of the third trimester. And about just over 80% of babies are born between 38 and 41 weeks as a reference. So basically, um, I have about two weeks until the clock really starts to tick. As a doula, I will mark my calendar two weeks before to up to two weeks after someone's due date as the range for when um, a baby can come. So it's kind of an interesting calendar time where it's not just looking at one day and aiming towards that, but looking at this range of time. So all that's to say, uh, what am I doing at 36 weeks? So the first thing that I'm working on this week is finalizing my postpartum support team list. Now, this is something that's happening a little bit later and in my pregnancy than I did for the first pregnancy and that I advise other people to do simply because we just moved to Valencia and so I'm still getting a lay of the land and getting to know who offers what and in what language, etc. But a postpartum support team list is essentially a list made up of two parts. The first is a list of professionals that we may need to call for support. Uh, this is kind of like if you're leaving your house on a date night, the list you leave with the babysitter, you know, of like emergency contacts. Hopefully no phone calls will need to be made, but in case they are, here are the people that could be contacted. Um, specifically as it relates to postpartum, for me, that list looks like a lactation consultant, a pelvic floor therapist, acupuncturist, pr uh, prenatal and postpartum massage therapist. That looks like um, backup babysitters, a cleaning lady. Um, I already have an amazing kind of life coach that I work with who specializes in prenatal health. so. If I didn't have her, I would also be adding like a reproductive therapist or a, a mental health counselor who specializes in the perinatal time. And again, these are people that um, in some cases, like my pelvic floor therapist, I've already been working with someone, um, but you know, with a lactation consultant, hopefully I won't need to have an appointment with her after the baby comes, but who knows? And so it's good to have someone during a calm time and ideally kind of a point of care can be established. Um, so the professionals, super important to have. So you're not left scrambling, newly postpartum, like feeling not like yourself bleeding and trying to figure out who is a safe person to, to work with. For this list, I have totally been referring to my mama network, to my local friends in Valencia, um, Facebook groups, just asking all over the place for recommendations and then trying to have conversations with some of these practitioners. And then for babysitters, etc., just doing lots of um, conversations and interviews. So I have some people on hand. Um, and your list may include other things as well. Um, if you have pets like a dog walker, obviously the babysitter um, that I referenced is in case I need a little extra support with my older daughter, Lila. Um, you may need other support related to your job or other kind of professional care and it's totally dependent on the person but those are the things that I'm looking at and then personally a list of family friends extended people in the network other moms people that I can 
reach out to if I want to have a connection with another adult human, people I can text, like, is this normal? People that I know love me and that I love and feel safe with. And it sounds simple and obvious, right? Because you know who's in your life in theory. But during really sleep deprived times, during moments of feeling low or feeling really different, um, having a list that I can be like, oh my God, yeah, of course, Tara, I'm just gonna give her a quick call and see if she's around for a minute. It makes a huge difference. It's also really helpful to share this list with your partner or anyone who's kind of giving direct care to you. So in a time where I'm like, I don't know why I can't stop crying. Um, my husband Warren might be like, "Hey, um, why don't you why don't you see if Camden's around?" Or maybe he'll even text one of my friends and say, "Hey, can you check in with Elizabeth?" So that's a really important one to do in advance because, again, in the heat of the moment, sometimes you can forget just how many people love you and want to support you and are and are there for you. Number two, uh, this week is a week of continued from kind of the past couple of weeks of having conversations with, with Warren. Um, and he's kind of my number one partner and support person, so that's why it's with him. But you can have this with your mother or friend or sister or whoever's kind of going to be around with you. So having conversations that can be fun, like visioning conversations, as well as conversations that can be a little bit difficult, like... How are we going to handle having our in-laws staying in our apartment? How are we going to feel and what communication is necessary is kind of questions. Um, so having conversations around how we, what, what kind of we feel worried about in the postpartum phase, in those first kind of 40 days especially, um, kind of visioning and brainstorming about what our basic needs might be during that time and how can we support each other to make sure that they're met. For example, Warren is a big routine person. If he has his morning routine where he can meditate and work out, he is like the top of the world kind of person. And when that gets disrupted too many days in a row, it's not a good feeling for him. So actually making sure that we've built in extra care and support in the mornings for me so that he can go and get a sweat session in is a really important thing for both of us. Um, so then he can show up for me for the rest of the day and he can feel good as he does it. Um, other conversations are around things that we have no idea the answers to, but the point isn't to necessarily have an answer or come to a conclusion, but it's really just about talking out scenarios and getting comfortable with different possibilities. So we only know what we know based on the, the experience we have with baby number one, Lila, from two years ago. And then I, of course, am fortunate to have some context from um, the research I've done for my book, as well as the clients that I've been so fortunate to support as well. So like I have, you know, other examples and, and context, but ultimately we have no idea how we're going to feel or what this little baby is going to be like. Is he going to be a great sleeper? Is he going to be a colicky kid? Is he going to have a tongue? is he going to be an angel we have no clue what's gonna kind of come and we have no idea how we're really gonna be um, what we do know is that it's not gonna be the same as with our first so although we can have that point of reference it's really important to have conversations where we can just brainstorm other possibilities of what could happen and just so we can get comfortable with anything <laughs> pretty much um, and I find this to be really a comforting thing. Sometimes the conversations get a little stressful, uh, when I'm like, I don't know if I'm going to feel ready to go back to seeing clients after eight weeks, or I don't know what's going to happen if we have people come sooner than I feel ready and they're flying across the, the world. So it's not like a last minute cancellation is possible. It's like that stuff kind of feels stressful, but at the same time, it's, important to sit with and to be with. And again, it's not about the outcome or knowing the answer. It's about kind of being comfortable with the uncomfortable and the processing of different possibilities. And so too, with kind of scenario uh, playing or scenario brainstorming, what happens if the birth goes differently than we expect? What if I end up having a cesarean birth instead of a vaginal birth? That totally changes the recovery timeline. That changes my capacity to 
do basic household things to you know physically care for myself or m this new baby or with lila so those kinds of conversations just getting kind of in the habit of thinking about them is really really crucial um and so we usually do that at dinner time towards the end of the day when we can just be relaxed and um try not to take on too much at a time but a little bit a little bit kind of has been what we've been doing <laughs> um and really cool things have been coming out of it too. Not just um, deeper levels of alignment beyond what I could have expected, but also um, this feeling of being super connected. Like Warren comes up with ideas for me or points things out that I wasn't even aware of in myself. So I feel really appreciative for that. Um, and yeah, it kind of just reinforces like our teamwork and, and that just always a good thing. <laughs> Uh, and then another thing that we're doing kind of little bit by little bit, or really I'm doing because I absolutely love it, is starting food preparation. So although I'm so excited and so grateful, uh, my mother-in-law who facilitated my Tsuo Yuetsu kind of 40-day postpartum last time with Lila, she's going to be coming over to Spain around the timing of my due date. So who knows when the baby will come, but like she'll be there to help me for the first few weeks and to... She's one of the best cooks. She's just absolutely amazing. And she makes the most nourishing meals. So she'll be helping a lot with food. Uh, and then my mom's coming shortly thereafter. And she's also an amazing, amazing cook. And I know that she'll be just such a blessing in our lives to kind of be a part of the healing journey. But for the in-between times or if things happen differently than expected or for a fill in the blank reason, I'm going to be preparing and freezing a bunch of different meals and snacks that I can have on hand, whether it's for myself or for Warner Lila. Having something that we know in a matter of minutes or hours can be defrosted, warmed up, and enjoyed easily just takes the stress off of mealtime and also eating regularly, which is super essential for everyone's kind of central nervous system, as well as blood sugar stability, as well as overall peace of mind. Um, and as I hope to be, as I hope to plan to breastfeed, and I plan to hope to, I both plan to and hope to breastfeed, I know I'm gonna be ravenous. Um, so basically every week, I'm just picking a couple of snacks or like soups and stews and making them. And then I just have freezer safe Ziploc bags that I'm using because it's more efficient. Our freezer is not that big here in Spain. Um, for my first pregnancy, I attempted this with like beautiful glass jars and half of them broke in the freezer because I overfilled them. So now I'm just second baby, keeping it simple uh, with, with freezer safe um, bags. And so this week I have picked up some really yummy uh, grass-fed beef bones from the local butcher. Um, and I'm just mixing in tons of vegetables, spices, and I'm gonna make a big batch of bone broth. And then I also got some gorgeous medjool dates that are beautiful and enormous. And I'll be filling them with different seed and nut butters like tahini and almond butter, putting some cacao nibs in there and mixing in a little bit of um, immunity boosting dried powdered mushroom as well so it's like a little boost it's a little snack that tastes almost like a snickers or a treat it keeps blood sugar like nice and up there um, and are super easy to to make and even easier to eat one-handed uh, i go really deep into this in my book but basically for the early postpartum time all meals need to be as easily consumed as possible so that means foods that are one-handed foods like soups that can be drunk out of a mug um, in case you know only one hand is available because you're holding the baby uh, or stews or porridges that can be um, easily taken in like a little cup um, things that are wrapped kind of like swaddled foods i call it uh, whether that's like a burrito that's already kind of prepared and put in the freezer um, or like a frittata baked into a muffin tin. These are all really simple things. So step by step every week, just adding a few things. Next week, I'll be doing some stuff with kitchari, which is an Ayurvedic recovery food, a stew made of um, split peas and tons of turmeric. And I have a bunch of other recipes that I've gathered 
both from my mother-in-law, from some of the interviews I've done for my book, and then from Hung O's first 40 Days Cookbook, which is awesome. Uh, so I love that part. I have so much fun with it. I think uh, Warren gets a little nervous when I make a lot of things in bulk. He's like, are we actually going to eat this? But I really feel so safe. It's kind of part of my nesting process. Um, and then the other couple of things that I'm doing this week is I am checking in with my calendar and knowing that I have two weeks until the 38 week mark, which again marks the starting point of when most births happen between 38 and 42 weeks is when most births happen. So I'm asking myself in these next two weeks, what absolutely needs to happen appointment wise, kind of overall life organization and logistics wise. Uh, for example, I made sure that Lila had her dentist appointment scheduled for next week so I can go there with her and take her there. Um, I made sure that I make a note in my calendar to have conversations with each of my clients to make sure that everyone's on the same page around the pause that I'll take for a, a little maternity leave. Um, things like that, things that if something you know the baby comes on 38 weeks on the dot that i'm like okay i've gotten that done and that also includes some personal stuff like getting my fingernails painted um, getting my hair trimmed things that make me feel really good and that's a big one that i recommend for for all the moms that i work with is that are you having your needs met and it's a lot easier to go to the hair salon when the baby's on the inside so that's something that um, i've been doing and then uh, the next thing I wanted to bring up is that at 36 weeks, this marks the time where it's a really great idea to kind of up the intake of a couple of different foods that can kind of prep your body for uh, labor and a smooth delivery. So I've started taking every day a couple of medjool dates and adding them to my smoothies um, or adding them into like a, like a bliss ball snack. Medjool dates are one of the foods that have been studied across numerous cultures and have found to actually have a positive impact on labor and delivery. Specifically, there's a link with the nutrients in medjool dates and cervical ripening. So there's a kind of a, some connection between smoother labors and dates. And you know what, even if there weren't, I do love a good date. So I'm really happy to be eating more dates. The one thing is though that dates are very high on the glycemic index, so I'm always pairing them with good fats like different seeds or nut butters. Um, and I did that with Lila and I mean, I have no other frame of reference, but it felt great to do and I had a great labor and delivery, so hopefully that will continue. And then I'm also upping my intake of red raspberry leaf tea, which is a beautiful herb that is said to tone the uterus. Again, a labor prep drink that is enjoyable, whether it has a big impact or no impact. So I'm really, um, I'm enjoying that. The final thing that I'm focusing on this week at 36 is some birth prep. <laughs> now I save this for last because uh, it's important to note that for many of us, as we're thinking about our, our birth, we really kind of stop at the birth. It's like, do I have my labor kit packed? Have I you know, prepared childcare for my older kids. Like, what am I gonna do with the hospital? Do I have a birth preference or plan sheet? And that's all very important. Um, and it is one of the most important days, the birthday or days of, plural, if it's a long labor, of our lives. Um, however, what happens after that is way more uncharted territory and a time where most of us have way less support like we'll have more eyes on us and more care on us on the birthday than at any other time really in the pregnancy and so it's kind of the and you can think about it different ways but I kind of see it as if I'm a little bit less prepared for the birth uh, but more prepared for all that's going to come afterwards I'm putting myself in a way better position um, that's not to say that it has to be either or. So in terms of birth prep, um, we are deep into our class series of private hypnobirthing classes with our doula. We're so excited. Our doula, Anna, is amazing. She's Valencian originally and lived abroad in Dubai for eight years. And since coming back to Valencia is supporting women with births. And I think 
she's just has this beautiful um, kind of breadth of experience and trainings and she is a, a really an advocate for hypnobirthing. I read a couple of hypnobirthing books in the first pregnancy but never did really many of the the actual practices and never did classes and so we were really excited that she offered that for us and so Warren and I have been doing a lot of visualizations and through those classes having other conversations around the birth and our preferences so this week we when we met with Anna we actually went through and kind of drafted out a birth preferences slash birth plan vision that I'm gonna be organizing into a, a nice little document um, for our midwife and OB and I also have gotten started on packing our labor kit, which I'll get into in another video, as well as an overnight bag for Lila, um, as she will be staying with our dear family friends while we are having the baby. <laughs> and so we want that to all be smooth and ready to go. And then finally, just making sure that our stroller, we use the Duna, which is a car seat slash stroller. It's the best thing ever. I'm totally obsessed is good to go it's the same one that we had for lila so just making sure it's clean and all the straps make they're in the right place and then that our, our bassinet which we use the snoo which is also something i'm totally obsessed with it's a magical bassinet making sure that is just like plugged in and in the right place and whenever it needs to be used it can be so that's what i've been doing this week and what i plan to keep doing and uh, i'll be checking in again soon with kind of where i'm at as we get even closer but I hope this is helpful or inspiring and please check in if you have any questions or ideas or comments um, or feedback based on what you're hearing. Uh, so thank you and have a beautiful day.